Hello and welcome to the Discovering Sligo podcast. In this series we are going to discover lots about the past and present of Sligo. From geology to archaeology, history, heritage, folklore, fishing, music and more. Join me and my guests and my dog Lucky as we discover what Sligo has to offer. So, hello and welcome to episode 3 of the Discovering Sligo podcast. In this episode, we're back in the Mailcoach Road studio and I'm delighted to be in the company of Pork Meehan. Pork, you're very welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Sally. Pork, you're another person with a large biography, but to give a snapshot, you're a native of Croton near Boyle in Roscommon, but you've grown a big passion for Sligo over the years and you're living locally now. You're a talented musician and songwriter, even working with groups such as IOU, the predecessor to Westlife, and you're a founding member of the band Those Nervous Animals, along with directing stage shows and pantomimes, and there's even more. Recently retired from Caramore Tombs as a seasonal guide where I met you first, you're now the chairperson of Sligo Neolithic Landscapes Group. So with all that in mind, Pork, would you give me a bit of background to where you grew up And what inspired you to delve into these different areas of interest from music to archaeology? Yeah, Sally, well, as you said rightly, I'm a Roscommon man. Um, Grew up in in Crohan, uh, went to school in Boyle. And um, one of my very earliest memories was looking from, we lived on the the top of a hill. And when I was a wee baby, they used to put me out the front and I could look into Leitrim, look, look east. And there was... Uh, Shimor with a bump on the top of it and that, no one ever asked why there was a bump on the top of it that in recent more recent years a great big white crucifix has been put there or not perhaps not so recent I think it's from the 50s but uh, I remember this sort of shining crucifix with lights on it uh, would 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 be there as we walked home from dances uh, uh, making tracking our way um, um, trudging back from Leitrim but um, yeah, and then I remember as well in the 1960s uh, going to Sligo with relations and for the first time seeing Nocton Ray and, and pestering my aunt uh, who used to work in Sligo. She, uh, they lived in uh, all over the world, but um, asking her, what was that and who lived inside it? And then I heard about Queen Maeve and I did some investigation. I was about 13 or so. Um, so that was the first sort of flush of passion about places like this. I was, I was in art college then. So while I was in art college in Sligo, the excavation of Caramore was going on. And a number of the people that were on the course involved there, uh, in particular uh, Patricia Mulligan, uh, Patricia Curran as she was then, um, who was an assistant to Bjorn Hunt on the dig. And uh, I made a number of visits during the excavation. And uh, obviously, you know, that, that was another thing. I, I also visiting Newgrange when I was on those Nervous Animals. I used to, we, the Nervous Animals first recordings were done with John D in his studio there, right by Newgrange. And so occasionally, when, whenever you took a break, you'd go up, pop over and have a look at the ancient monuments. That's fascinating. And Pork, as I said earlier, I met you first and you were working in Caramore as a seasonal guide. And for many seasons, you worked there. I find it's an amazing place to work, I think you'll agree. But what was it that kept you going back there every season? And what was your favorite part of that role? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, you know, um, it was an extraordinary place. I mean, I have to give some credit here to sort of the structure there. There was uh, Austin McTiernan was the head guide at the time, and he had a very kind of open-minded attitude towards everyone developing their own tour. And like, there was a huge sort of encouragement for to do research. Um, so some of us went and, 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 and you know, went back as uh, mature students to, uh, under the, at the time it was Galway, uh, to study a little bit and uh, that sort of led on to um, research so many people have been through there and I can, I can you know, can name them you know uh, if you like but I mean we all know all, all these various people who've studied and produced work and produced papers and produced research and uh, as it was uh, I was one of them and that joined the human population dynamics at Carol Keel team and also this NWAG team both of whom produced papers relating to Carol Carol Keel, Robert Hensey was it Rob Stefan Berg doing the uh, the Bone Pin project, and so therefore the amount of work that there the, the were guides, people working as guides there, and that was their nominal profession, uh, and as seasonal guides. But 
those guides produced a huge amount of work and were part of the whole process of, uh, of really the, the, the chronology of the Irish passage and tradition was, uh, was greatly contributed to by the work done that, by those groups. And there was discoveries over the years as well, and uh, no more than yourself. Uh, you have made a big discovery there some years ago, which I was fascinated by when I joined. Can you tell us a little bit about what happens in the autumn and spring at the Stahl? Yeah, well, in 2004, uh, Mark Keane uh, was another guy there, and another very clever and thoughtful and imaginative man who contributed to one of those debates. Uh, he made the observation and made the comment, Lissal is is unusual in the Sligo context because we have so many huge monuments. We have like it, this survey that we did recently, the Baystown survey, numbered a hundred passage and tradition or affiliated uh, tradition monuments in the area. But one of the rare ones that's been reconstructed is Listahal. So that had had a lot of uh, intervention, you know, probably in the late 1600s, uh, certainly in the 1700s. By the time Gabriel Beranger came in, it was already much ruined, and there were folklore accounts of it being used as a quarry. So then a reconstruction was made of it, a re- an excavation was made of it in, in, in 1998 and 96 98 by Bjorn Hunt. And um, afterwards, then it was kind of reconstructed. And I did, it was one of the subjects that I took on as my, uh, as one of my survey sites during the little uh, work that I was doing in, in, in college. And um, Mark had observed that it was pointed towards what he thought would have been the cross quarter day alignment, that moment in time between uh, the equinox and, and the solstice. And that's sort of, you know, that's, that's realized in different ways since the time of the oracle bones in China. Uh, everything from observation of animals that the change from autumn to winter. So um, we started to look at that. And in 2008, uh, along with Jean Ryan, she was there that morning, uh, we, we saw it, uh, the, the fact that the sun, there's a little, a little um, dip in the Ox Mountains. I mean, if you stand at Carrow Moor, it's, on the, it's at the very center of the Kulira Peninsula. So to your west, uh, you've got uh, Nocknare, the profile of, of the impressive mountain of the Cairn on top. And to the east, you've got these four hills, all with monuments on, on, on the top. And just a little to the left of that again, there's a dip, uh, a gentle curve in the hills, a natural curve in the hill, with two little bumps either side, the kind of shoulders, um, like a naked. And that is the position we saw the sun rise there, cupped in that, and it shines down, and then it makes a very impressive visual effect inside the chamber, in that there is a, a blocking stone, which doesn't bear any weight, which has a sort of gable shape and a curved top, called Stone B by Bjorn Hunt. And it throws a shadow on the underside of the roof slab, which is about 1.3 meters long. And that uh, is a very striking visual effect inside the chamber. So both the horizon effect and what happens in the chamber uh, were, were uh, interesting and, were, uh, and, and memorable. And what was it like being there that first morning and um, when that when that discovery was being made? Because we've, uh, we've only seen it a couple of times since that. The sun doesn't always shine in yeah. Sligo, unfortunately. Yeah, it, it, this happens twice yearly. It happens on the 31st of October and it happens on the 10th of February. It's the exact same as Tara, as the Mound of the Hostages in Tara does the exact same thing. They're 20 minutes separated from them. Um, and I think the two big discoveries were the initial one of seeing this physically happening. I mean, the excitement, it's just the two of us, myself and Jean, and she was calmer than I was. I had a decent camera. I had a nice Canon SLR, but she had just, you know, consumer camera. It was a nice camera she had. She, she dropped it over board of some ships since, but um, she took str- wonderful photographs. She kept the cool and... But, but our excitement was off the radar. And then the other thing was the day that I went to Tara and Mark Roddy was in Sligo and we were on the phone to each other and you're know, looking at the time difference and comparing the fact that these two alignments. And another one that's also very tightly synced to that, we've been looking at the, the, the monograph on Ballinahattie is just out. Uh, and in the monograph gives Ballinahattie has 115 degrees azimuth. Tara is 113 degrees azimuth because and uh, is 116. And the reason for the difference is the difference of the height of the horizon. So that these compensate for the horizon height and still manage to, to shine at, at a particular day. That's so interesting. And I know you've written a book uh, about that as well, which people can pick up there in Libra. 
and uh, it's a great great read and definitely one to look out for if you're looking for more information on that particular topic but for it since 2021 you've been retired from Caramore. we miss you and uh, i don't think life has got much less busy for you though you're now the chairperson of silent analytic landscapes snl uh, but can you explain a bit how that group came about and what the main aims have been over the last number of years right well snl officially came into being as a public participation network body in 2015 before that there were a number of us that had sort of informally met and met the council and done other things but I, that's that's the official life of it and that we took on more members at that point in time um and the, the group since then have been involved i suppose put it this way the the primary aims of the group were the protection of the uh, ancient heritage in particular the passage to traditional monuments of sligo that i mean some of us had been involved in the research around um the topography around the landscape scenario uh, and about around the and the dating as we mentioned um and and also dna work um so what was th- there was clearly no plan there was no integrated protection plan and we, we asked why that was the case and different agencies were in charge of different things everything was seemed to, be, to some degree piecemeal and there was very little governance in a way because it was so fragmentary so what we what we would love to see an overall integrated agreed plan that's that's owned by the people of Sligo and about everybody from the business side from the tourism side from the archaeology and conservation side, and that we look at a sustainable long-term plan to maintain the monument. And we came to the conclusion that the best route to, to do that was by applying for World Heritage Site status for a serial bid, including the two big centres at Caramore, Caraquil, joined by the Ancient River, and this halo of uh, sites that surround these, both in the immediate small clusters at Caraquil and Caramore, and then in the outlying sites for example, Nachnaray, Ballygawley, Cairns Hill in the, in the north, and in the south, Kish and Silu and Ardloy and, and the other ones that are in the southern sector. And we then uh, joined with Sligo County Council in making an application for tentative world heritage site status. Uh, and that was, uh, that's been achieved now three years or two years. Um, so uh, the next stage now is to uh, endeavour to, to achieve full uh, inscription as a world heritage site and so along the way you've had some great developments the tentative listing obviously being primary but also that production of baseline study i think has been massive and along with that you have recently held a workshop last autumn which i think was a big step in the right direction as well you must be delighted with what the group has achieved so far well, we are we're we're happy, uh, Sally, that that um, there's been a good response. But what we found is we found partnerships uh, with, you know, different groups. I mean, we have what well, part of our work during the COVID period was to do, try and do outreach remotely. It was kind of a difficult time, but we did t- talk to many community groups. We talked to landowners. We talked to what they call the stakeholders. They, those people who they are, for various and different reasons that have. Uh, you know directly impacted um, and we found tremendous support so we're you know uh, hugely encouraged by the political uh, support we're getting and by the interest in people have in it and by the sort of curiosity and people are really want to know more and want to learn about it because the, this sort of gradual appearance of the riches of Sligo is a kind of late it's kind of a late development. Everyone always sort of thinks of the Kylie Vera. Well, she's in Kerry, isn't she? Well, but she's here as well. When people think about passage tombs, they think, oh, that's in, that's in the east in Meath or something. But 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 the riches of Sligo, having two of the great centres here, on uh, near closer together than any other two great centres uh, in Ireland, only sort of twenty-two kilometres separating two massive centres at each end of the ocean and the Ocean Valley, and all that goes with it, the mythology is so rich. The Battle of Moitre is set here. Um, you know, Mor and Enoch is probably Caramor. All these extraordinary things. And uh, so therefore, this kind of, um, how to say, gradual uh, awareness, is, it's a joy to me to see people taking an interest and people joining us on various little events we've organised and walks up there and talks. 
and um, it, it, that's that's very positive from our point of view. Anyway. So, what's next for the UNESCO process? Um, what's the overall vision that this could look like if if and when this is successful in the future? Well, we see ourselves as advocates for the preservation of the of the sites. So, I mean, there's another side to it, of course, and the other side to it is that making a world heritage. Uh, size and having sustainable tourism and, and having a plan and having governance and having some element of control and uh, you know measured judgment about these things will lead to great benefits for the area so things like dock airport things like tourism places like carol moore uh, the town of sligo itself um, should should benefit hugely from having a world heritage site uh, we've identified seven centers that would be the kind of uh, you know, outposts, the, the, the individual uh, attractions. Uh, and, the, the, and so that would be like uh, Carrow Moor, Knock, uh, the, on the, in the north, the, the, there would be Carrow Moor, there'd be Knocknaray, there'd be Cairns Hill, there'd be Ballygawney in the Ox Mountains, and then there's Cache and Carrow Keel down in the south. So you can imagine that anyone who would ever want to visit those, as uh, see them, would have to spend some time here. And if it was structured in a good way, you could do it in a way that didn't impact too much and there would be some sites of course that wouldn't be visited and there'd be decisions made around that and it, it's just it's not that we want to determine and dictate how that all is implemented but rather that we have a conversation and that we're part of that conversation and that the conversation is inclusive and that the conversation is wide-ranging so this it's not going to happen overnight it's going to be a process that's going to take some time some say talk about five years talk about ten years and over that point in time, it's a process of consultation. The, the leaders and proponents in that respect are Sligo County Council. So both the, the Department of the National Monuments and Sligo County Council are the main players here. They're the, it's really, we've had our role in it. We were partners with the council in making the initial bid for tentative status. But the full World Heritage status will be something that the Irish government do. And it will be brought to Paris and it will be put, there will be a dossier assembled. And that dossier will be assembled by a nomination team. And Sligo County Council and the department together will put together that team. And you will have, you know, somebody will lead that team. There will be ex international experts there to advise them. There'll be a support body. There'll be community groups of all kinds and different elements of the community can contribute to that conversation. So um, we're, you know, positive about that. So I'm certainly uh, very excited about the future of both the archaeological research and the tourism elements that could be benefited. And I think you've made such good ground in a few years. So I wish you all the best in the future endeavours and continuing endeavours. And hopefully the, the moves will be made to bring this into reality very soon. Yes, Annie. I mean, I suppose the thing we, we are strong on is that, well, and we think it's very important that you don't fossilise anything. You don't freeze it in aspect. You're not trying to turn it into Sligo into a museum. Is that the place has to live, people have to get on with their lives, there will be changes, there will be things that impact us, but it's a negotiation. So, um, yeah, we were being fascinated by, by working on the Carrakeel bones, for example, we did a lot of work on that and, and all that, and we are you know, obviously represent a particular uh, viewpoint very much around the conservation, but w what we want really is to have a, a, a healthy conversation I think no reasonable person would think other than that we should preserve these treasures that are five to six thousand years old as in our midst and be aware of them and just teach children about them and, and sort of value the treasures that we have. And at the same time, we can climb the mountain and we can walk around and we can do things and carry on and enjoy a life with these in our midst. And I was just going to say in that regard, you know, when people do visit these sites, uh, some of the more remote ones particularly, how, how best should they approach them and how, how do we preserve those as a community in advance of major protections that could come down the line? Yeah, well, one of the things that I see, I, I, I kind of trying to get fit the last couple of years a little bit, uh, and I've been walking up on a few places, in particular Ballygawley and, and Nocknare, especially. They're great for, 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 for improving your fitness. But I notice that behaviour, although we've had a few high-profile uh, events that haven't helped um, uh, and we've seen vandalism at some of the sites but it's important I think to, to bear in mind that there are improvements and that there are positive things and one of them is that there's much less impact on Knocknaray um, now much less people are walking on the Cairn 
You shouldn't walk in the cairn, obviously. You shouldn't take anything away. Don't dig around the sites. Um, just re be respectful um, and, you know, leave no trace. Okay, so finally, before I let you go, it would be remiss of me not to talk music briefly. I might as well get you back again to have a longer chat on that, but my sister-in-law would never let me uh, let you away without talking about Westlife and IOU. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your involvement in that and some thoughts on your music ventures? Yeah, well, I was... Um, the the, the uh, 1980s uh, was a time when I was very much completely committed to music. Uh, I, was an, I was an art student for years. I was in uh, Sligo and Dunleary. And um, I then joined uh, Those Nervous Animals and so got that going. And we had, you know, after Those Nervous Animals, kind of, the, there was a hiatus. In the, in the early 90s, they came back and toured, but there was a, a, a hiatus period at the very end of the 19, 1980s. And in that period, I started to do other gigs like musicals and stuff. And I get to know a choreographer called Mary McDonough, who... Uh, was you know hugely influential in Sligo. I taught so many people, and I remember the MCR here beside us uh, being a, a venue for rehearsals and everything. Um, and at some point in time, Mary came to me uh, with this group of boys that had already done a sort of mid spot in one of her shows, um, you know, Greece or something, and um, as as a boy band. And um, my role in that was then Mary, another woman, and myself. Uh, sort of worked with the boys and we, we picked a name for them which was uh, ironically called IOU uh, and as it turned out but um, in the, the, the the process then was that um, I made I, I put together in James Bernard Hassett's studio uh, we put together uh, a recording with them they came out to my house I lived in Ross's Point and uh, Mark and uh, Shane uh, and they had songs, and we put together two songs, one song, a song called Together We Are Forever, and another one called Everlasting Love. And um, I was kind of co-writer on those, um, so that um, we demoed them, and we demoed a version of the Who song called um, um, Pinball Vigil. And uh, eventually, we were negotiating with the families to, um, to, to, to sort of have a management arrangement and that whereby we then try and get a deal for the boys for some those were the days when record companies actually gave you deals and um anyways long story short was this um the families uh, someone of the family saw uh, got, had a contact with louis walsh and went off using our backing tracks to play support for the backstreet boys and consequently uh, the boys uh, got signed um they I think they did, lost three of the members and added two other people, and that be Westlife became that. That was the band that Westlife became. Um, so uh, we had a little bit of uh, input into that. Yeah, that's very interesting. For it. you're a man with many hats, and it's been an absolute real pleasure talking to you today. And definitely look forward to having you back on in the future. Go meet him, August. I'll talk to you off. Folks, that brings us to the end of another episode. A big thank you to Porik Meehan for joining me in studio here in Mailcoach Road this episode. Big thanks to the ReCenter community for allowing us use of their building once again. As ever, if you'd like to sponsor the podcast, please do get in contact with me on the social media pages, Discovering Like a Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. In the next episode, I will be joined by Dr. Fiona Beglin, who was a former lecturer of mine in the IT in Sligo, now the ATU. Fiona is going to talk to us about Stodge Abbey, which is out near Grange in North Sligo, and it's in danger of being washed away by the rising sea levels and these really tough Atlantic storms that we've been getting over the last number of years. Join me on the next podcast to hear about another fascinating archaeological site in Sligo and don't worry if you're not into archaeology I promise there is some interesting podcast episodes coming up just for you.